Welcome to Spaceverse, your portal to cosmic adventures. Here at Starbase, our futuristic rocket factory, things are always happening quickly, and this week has been jam-packed with fresh, exciting info. Because Ship 30 is getting a lot of love and is getting back a lot of tiles it lost, we should start our adventure today at the Star Factory. Obviously, those aren't the tiles that were removed, they're now in the trash along with the Vertical Tank Farm and Booster 4. These are the Substitute Tiles, version 2, and they are supposedly twice as long-lasting as the old ones. Not only are they probably constructed from the same substance, but they are considerably denser and less easily abraded. Photos like this don't do justice to the lightning-fast development that SpaceX has been performing. It becomes obvious when one compares this to the situation just two days before. Because the ablative layer has expanded to cover a large area, new tiles have emerged and the silicone felt has been replaced, the progress has been rapid. It seems like they haven't even touched the more complicated heat shield components yet. Until SpaceX significantly improves the flap hinges, this ship will not be able to take off, as we learned from Musk's latest comment. Remember to stay tuned till the very finish. Regarding his remarks, we will go into further detail later on. Now, let's move our attention to the Sanchez lot. From there, we can see the sections for Tower 2 clearly, owing to our new flyover with Redland Hilly. The crews are back at it, preparing these parts one by one for transport to the next Starship Orbital Launch Tower. Since it is easier to construct items when they are not required to be transported to the top of a skyscraper, these parts are nearly equipped before stacking, in contrast to Tower 1. Regarding Tower 2, how about we take a helicopter ride to the launch location to check on the progress of the tower's base? Furthermore, we have a nearly finished base after only three weeks. Incredible! Concrete reinforcements for the tower's legs are almost complete, as demonstrated in our previous video. Next came the last touches to the base's furnishings. You may recall that the Sanchez tower pieces had plumbing and electrical already installed. An immediate tower in essence, this is it. Mechazilla strikes at the last possible second, doesn't it? Stacking cannot begin until the base is well equipped, as it is still in its constructed state and lacks the fleshing out that the segments have. The question is, when will the base be nearly finished and the stacking begin? It may take SpaceX a little longer before Piece 1 is carried and hoisted due to the reasons I just mentioned and additional site preparations that have not yet taken place. While no portions of the tower have yet arrived at the launch location, they are in the process of moving. In case you've been keeping up with the progress of this construction, you'll be aware that seven out of the nine parts required were constructed right here in Florida at the Cape. Then, after a week-long journey, they reached Texas and were then rolled to Sanchez. That was, however, the case with just half of the seven portions constructed in Florida. The building on Roberts Road, where they were manufactured, also had two additional pairs of chopsticks. Then they were transported to Brownsville by barge. After a brief delay caused by inclement weather, they finally arrived. Yes, all the tower pieces have been completed. The relocation from Brownsville's port to Sanchez is the next stop. As far as this event is concerned, SpaceX is SpaceX and we already have the closures. Each tower part is slated for a roll on the 26th and 27th. So the rollouts will probably occur shortly and if that's the case, the footage will be shown on the screen right now. Looking up at the tower, one can't help but notice the enormous crane that was previously absent. Can't disregard it long last, SpaceX has lifted the giant. The DMAG CC 8801 crane is almost fully assembled, with just a few missing parts. From this vantage point, it is easy to observe that the crane's broader boom at the base contributes to its stability. The Franken crane, on the other hand, featured a split boom that divided the weight of the crane into two smaller booms. Another perk and additional reason why SpaceX favors this new crane over the one that erected Tower 1 is that wider booms often have substantially higher integrity. I can't wait to watch these enormous cranes in action as they construct the tallest launch tower in the world, I find them interesting. How about we return to our original orbital launch mount? Our little booster 14.1 is probably leaving you wondering what's going on. It appears like the test was cancelled when this video was being recorded, therefore nothing had transpired. This might have occurred because the LR11000 crane was busy scrapping tank farms rather than helping with testing. The chopsticks were still pushed by SpaceX, but they were all over the place, as if they had had a few too many drinks. Not to mention how fast they were. At one point they did close around the booster, but they were quickly opened again. 
No test has been conducted on D14.1 as of the recording time. Closures are slated for around the time you watch this, and it is currently attached to a water line to add weight to the booster. In the meantime, if testing really took place, we will now play a clip of it. I was just going to say that SpaceX's LR11000 crane is currently dismantling the orbital tank farm, so I guess I should see how it's coming along. Once home to the most powerful rocket in the world, the orbital tank farm is now practically non-existent. I am, of course, referring to the classic orbital tank farm design, also known as the vertical tank farm, which used to house cryogenic propellants in a series of tanks with an outer shell and an interior tank. Do you know what happens after these tanks are scrapped? This is being moved forward quickly by SpaceX. All of these tanks must be dismantled before Flight 5, according to them. There were three tanks left when we last left off, and one of them was wearing its GS shell. There are only two tanks left, and they aren't even complete. SpaceX has been removing them at such a rapid speed that we might have one of the world's greatest views by the week's end. We will soon begin to observe more construction, or SpaceX has some hidden tower portions. Or maybe Musk misspoke and SpaceX will build the skyscraper to its original height and then raise it later. Almost immediately, I ruled out the possibility of erecting the tower subsequent to the stack due to the complexity involved. Therefore, we are still somewhat confused. The third alternative would be to simply elevate the ship's quick disconnect, making room for the larger starship. The launch pad is another component of the launch infrastructure that has changed. The new pad needs to be drastically different, as I've been stating for a while. I can assure you of that, a flame trench is on its way to us. After destroying a crater with Flight 1, Musk apparently thought that maybe there should be a somewhere for all that pressure to go. Naturally, his original concept wasn't wholly incorrect. After some repairs, the launch pad with the flood plate has survived the most recent flights with relative ease. Despite its usefulness, the water deluge plate was never my favorite. Rather than being a fantastic solution, it is more of a patch for an earlier design and is not easily reused. On the other hand, the launch pad is undergoing a complete renovation, not merely a trench. After the destruction of the launch mount legs constructed by SpaceX at the Cape, we had our suspicions, but now we have confirmation. Since Musk has already stated that Tower 1 will be utilized for catch attempts, this is probably also the reason SpaceX is constructing Tower 2 prior to launch mount 2. As a result, it appears that the catch-only tower is currently unavailable. Related to modifications made to the ship's heat shield following Flight 4, Musk also said something noteworthy. Flight 4 also included testing the ablative with a single and double coating to gauge its performance. While the double layer effectively insulated the Starship, maintaining its interior at a comfortable temperature, the single layer permitted just enough heat to cause the steel to glow. Crucially though, the steel might not have broken. Therefore, SpaceX may choose to use a single coating of ablative material on fewer heat-sensitive components, hoping that this, in addition to the steel's heat tolerance, will be sufficient. Musk went so far as to say that the ship's internal cameras showed the payload bay to be red-hot but not melting more evidence that SpaceX made the right choice in using steel. Much obliged to Elon for his candor and transparency, and to Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, for making public his incredibly illuminating interview. With Musk's announcement that the next launch will occur no later than 60 days following Flight 4, Starship is now moving full speed ahead. The launch frequency is growing rapidly, as we are currently approximately one-third of the way through the next launch. Some of SpaceX's rivals, though, may find that SpaceX's lightning-fast frequency to be an obstacle. It appears that they are attempting to complain to the government in an effort to delay the launches. SpaceX is now dealing with an issue at the Florida Starship launch pad, so let's talk about it. It appears that not everyone is pleased with Starship's launch from Florida, despite our enthusiasm for it. The FAA issued a call for public feedback on the Starship launch program at LC-39A after the draft environmental impact statement was finished. Blue Origin was one of the sources that voiced these concerns. Yes, I was wrong. The number of Starship launches that SpaceX plans to accomplish is the source of the issue. Since the other pads near the Cape are need to be closed so often to accommodate Starship, Blue said it would be difficult to use any of them. Even though this is coming from a firm that has never been to orbit, there is every reason to be concerned about it. In case you were wondering, once LC-36 is operational, Blue Origin plans to launch its new Glenn Heavy Lift rocket. The new Glenn rocket, however, will be reusable, so it should have a fast turnaround time as well. 
Being unable to launch New Glenn as often as Blue Origin would want is a major setback for the company. Not only would Blue Origin profit from this, but so would other firms like EULA and Relativity Space, who are also working on rockets with the intention of always flying. No rocket firm should have a stranglehold on the launch industry. That being said, I'm not claiming that Starship is the most significant rocket. Also, if SpaceX forbade other companies from launching, this would happen. Concerns about the possibility of pad damaging shockwaves caused by Starship's enormous thrust were also raised by Blue Origin. This has happened previously at Starbase. Both LC-39A and the launch pads in the vicinity could be impacted by this. To prevent other pads from being damaged by the shockwaves, they are requesting that SpaceX put the required infrastructure in place. When I put it this way, I can see why Blue Origin would be upset about this. It is critical to provide every company an equal opportunity in the launch market. Some in the space community are understandably suspicious of Blue's intentions considering his track record of evading justice. It's all about that in public conversation. Restricting SpaceX's Starship development would not be the best course of action considering how significant it is. Instead of putting people in risk, they know how to return a booster, which is a significant improvement over our following story. An unfortunate story from this week's news warrants our attention. The Long March 10, a type of rocket. There is a long line of Long March rockets, starting with one and going all the way up to 11, and that is just the older brother. Among these rockets is the Long March 2, which has been flown more times than any other Chinese rocket. Let me tell you something, it's not that easy. Although there are other variants of the Long March 2, the 2C will be the one we'll be discussing today. Spacecraft for communication and Earth observation typically use this medium lift vehicle. The SVA mission was very recently launched, and the vehicle has 76 flights under its belt. Let me not bring it to your attention, but the payload was a tiny X-ray telescope built by the French and the Chinese. Everything about the expedition seemed flawless, so why the hitch? In the sake of public safety, the first stage and any side boosters of non-reusable rockets are typically ejected into the ocean upon launch. The catch is that this isn't even conceivable from where Long March 2C takes off. Due to the lack of a coast for launch, the initial phases are simply bypassed over land. I mean, surely that's acceptable so long as they aren't dumping it on people. That, however, was not the actual event. Actually, it was the complete reverse. No problem at all. You can see the unattractive result of dropping the booster over a Chinese town caused by the payload slant. This town was unprepared for such a terrifying sight since the rocket seems to have landed far from its planned location. Fortunately, no injuries have been reported by town officials. While this may not be significant in China, it is nonetheless reason for concern. The fuel used by the rocket is hypogolic, meaning it burns when it comes into contact with the oxidizer. We may go into more detail on the different uses of this fuel type in upcoming films, but for the time being, just know that it is extremely poisonous. The propellant can cause burns to the lungs just by inhaling it. That is not all though. It is acidic, toxic, and carcinogenic as well. An authentic all-in-one murderer. It is possible that the hazardous gases spread across the community, as indicated by the orange smoke. Nevertheless, it was just a single slip-up, wasn't it? The Chinese space program has a long history of accidents like this one, with rockets having fallen on various towns. Routine operations. They appear to be putting more emphasis on developing new technologies than ensuring the security of their applications. This must end immediately. Although the public's safety should never be jeopardized, China is undeniably a major player in the space exploration industry. You have to give them props for their recent forays into the realm of reusable spacecraft development. There have been three tests of small Chinese prototype rockets hopping at low altitudes in the past year alone. Another test has been conducted. A new test vehicle ascended, descended, and landed without a hitch on June 23. The vehicle will certainly aid CSC in developing a future reusable rocket. However, the firm did not reveal its identity. Additionally, it serves as a platform for testing important physical concepts that the rocket in question must adhere to. These vital systems have come a long way, and this test sets a new record for the highest altitude a spacecraft has flown and landed from Chinese soil at 10 kilometers. The Chinese economy seems to be heading in the right direction, since they plan to begin operating Falcon 9-like aircraft in 2026. Plus, what's even better? It will not be necessary to dump these boosters on unwary individuals. 
Despite being a very noteworthy debut, our next tale is one that many of you could have actually overlooked. Since SpaceX launches so frequently these days, it's easy to lose track of what's truly remarkable when things become normal. In particular, if the launch is not a Starship SpaceX mission. Why then? Was that another record Falcon 9 broke? Sure enough, that's always the case. There are two functioning rockets owned by SpaceX, therefore I'm not even going to mention Falcon 9. Naturally, I'm talking about Falcon Heavy, which accomplished everything. The 10th launch has been completed. Falcon Heavy launches at a somewhat normal pace, in contrast to Falcon 9. The first launch of this three-core behemoth this year is NASA's GOES-U satellite. Falcon Heavy's limited use cases are a bummer, considering how impressive it is to see. Plus, Falcon Heavy will probably take a backseat to Starship once it becomes operational. Sadly, rockets with WOWs cannot be purchased. A heartfelt thank you for being here with us today as we come to the end of our journey at Spaceverse. Your support is what drives our investigation of the cosmos. Remember to hit the notification bell and subscribe to our channel so that you can continue to explore with us. See you until the next time we cross paths in the cosmos.